Okay, some of you have to admit you were probably doing the head move during that. You know you were. Uh, Welcome, everyone, and a happy 2019 to our Henderson campus, our West campus, uh, and our East Evansville campus. And I hope you guys have a fantastic uh, New Year. You know, as I think about our campuses and I look back to when they started, uh, what many of you may not know, we are forever indebted to teams of people who devoted themselves to doing this. We would gather up uh, teams from 30 to 50, and they would devote time and resources, and they even went through training on how to do this, and then that's what resulted in our campuses when we opened. Well, one of the training exercises, uh, we gave a question that was kind of a mental exercise uh, that I like so much that is actually a part of our Kickstart experience as well. Sarah was telling all of you that we have this thing called Kickstart, and this is one of the questions that we do, and uh, I want to give this question to you guys. Have you thinking? about it because it's relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. Imagine this. Here's the mental experiment. Imagine this, a guy like a, uh, some gajillionaire out there, an Elon Musk or whatever else, and I think it does say that he is a gajillionaire. It's official now. Um, But someone like that comes to you and says, here's what I want to do for you. I want to finance your dream house. In other words, I want to buy it for you. And money, so money is no object. I want you to think about what you would build. You can build this house anywhere in the world that you want. You can build anything that you want. You can put anything in the house you want. Money is no object, just go for it. And then we have people write down, what would you build if that was, uh, well, that was you? And I want you to think about that a little bit. Now, the reason we do that is because it's a great way to get to know people, kind of find out where their values and all that sort of thing uh, and on a personal level. But also, I, I've learned a lot about people in general. I've learned one, I've done this dozens of times. One, the world is divided into two groups. There are beach people and there are mountain people. Beach people and mountain people. There are more beach people than there are mountain people. And that's hard for me to say because I'm a mountain person, but uh, there's a majority of beach people. It's also kind of funny and ironic that I've always done this with Midwest people where there are no beaches and there are no mountains, okay? So (laughs) what does that say about all of us? We would live somewhere else. That's not really true, but we don't live near the beach or the mountains. So you learn that. Uh, you also learn that some people are very social. They're all about, their dream house would be all about the parties. It would have lots of space. There'd be games everywhere. There'd be four-wheelers outside. There'd be trampolines. You hear people say things like that. Some people are the exact opposite. They want to go to the mountains because they want a big wall. I don't like to say the word wall in these days, but a big wall around uh, where they're in because they stay private, that kind of stuff. Uh, if I'm being honest, the most creative people are usually younger I still remember this one college kid. He probably gave the, uh, the most creative answer. He said, what I'd have, I would have this elevator that would go down in the ground. It, it would go right at the, like this bat cave looking place. And there would be this lake. And my bed would be floating on a lake underground. And the ceiling would be nothing but a giant screen where I could watch ESPN all the time. I thought, now that person's thinking, right? But my favorite answer was one very sincere young lady gave. And she said, well, I I would build as many bedrooms as I possibly could for all the orphans that I'd like to adopt. Now, when someone answers the question that way, it does a few things. Number one, you're like, oh, okay. Uh, That's probably the right answer. And, you know, you know, Batcave guy's probably like, well, I, you know, Batcave obviously came after, you know, orphan time, and the orphans could play in the Batcave, and I'm, and, you know, everybody starts adjusting, you know, it's the answer Jesus would give. Uh, and, and by the way, if you go to Kickstart, that's the right answer, that's what you're supposed to say. Uh, she really did say that, she was totally sincere, so it also shut down discussion completely, it was a very awkward moment for all of us. Uh, but uh, the reason I bring all this up is because we are starting this uh, series called Build, right? And build is, is all around the metaphor that the Bible gives more than once. Jesus does this. We'll look at this next week. But he, they give this metaphor that I've told you many times that God gives you things in the Bible that you can see to help you understand the things that you cannot see. We're building spiritual lives that we can't see, but he uses uh, objects and physical things that we deal with. And buildings, whether it's our house that we're living in or the city that we're, uh, we're walking around in, that's, a, that's an illustration of what it's like to build things uh, spiritually. So we're going to use that metaphor and explore it for a couple of different reasons. The first reason is, it's based on, this is another Kickstart promo, what, you, what happens when you go to Kickstart is we have 
12 values uh, as a church that we've put together over time. Just, and our values mean just kind of what makes us unique. What are the specific things that we care deeply about, maybe compared to other churches or other organizations, just mean a whole lot to us. And one of them is, we say this all the time, we don't want to build just a great church. We want to build a great city. We don't want to build just a great church. We want to build a great city and do that both locally and globally. And what that means is, is that we don't want to be just a church building where everybody kind of hunkers down on Sunday morning and, and not be contributors to our community. We want to go out in the community between Monday and Saturday and be contributors economically, in education, in the arts. We want to make our cities, the, where we are, better places to be. We want to build cities along with that. That's what that means. It's very important to us around here. Now, one of the goals of the series over the next several weeks is I want everybody at One Life to have a get it factor about what we mean by that. What does that look like? And not only have a get it factor, but also by the end to be able to see yourself within it because I think it's very, very freeing. I think it'll be one of those things where you'll see how God can use you in your vocation, in your neighborhood, in your family and relationships towards this goal of building a great city for your neighbors, but also doing something that God wants done in people's lives. I want you to be able to see yourself in it. Now, the parallel with that is as we walk through what it takes to build a great city and everything, it will also teach us all, I think, how to build great lives, uh, because great cities are made up of people living great lives. And according to the Bible, what's a great life look like? How do you build it? And that's where we're going to begin. So we're, we're going we're to end with talking about economy and arts and all those things and our participation in that. We'll be kind of spread out out here. But where we're going to begin today in, 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 the, week, in the first couple of weeks is we're going to narrow it all the way down and begin with our own individual souls, our own individual lives. What does it take to build a great life? Using the, uh, the building metaphor. So, uh, and believe it or not, what I, what I did to get ready for this is I, I knew nothing about building, I still don't much, but I did a little crash course on what it takes to build a house. What, it, what, it, what goes into it and you physically, if you wanted to build any dream house or anything else, what would you do? Now, I think everybody knows this, but as I, I noticed something. I've noticed that no matter what, if you're building your dream house, if you're putting a bat cave in there, if you're building something for orphans, it doesn't make any difference. The most essential beginning point that you must have if that thing's going to work right is made of something that's not very sexy at all. You know, we all think about whether it's four-wheelers or screens or beds floating around on lakes. We think about the amenities when we think about our dream house, right? But you can't get to the amenities properly unless you have something that's made of dirt, concrete, and steel. And we all know that's called the foundation. And so as I was looking through this, speaking of the metaphor, I want you to hear a quote defining a foundation, literally and physically. This is on a building site. And it was so good, I'm just going to keep repeating this thing and tie it to the scripture that we're going to read here in just a moment. Listen what they say of what a foundation actually is. Quote, by definition, a home's foundation is the load-bearing portion of the structure, typically built below ground. By definition, think metaphor, everybody. A home's foundation is the load-bearing portion of the structure, typically built below ground. I love that term, load-bearing. It's the thing, the reason it's so important is it's what takes the weight. So if you're going to have a bat cave, if you're going to have a screen, if you're going to have whatever you're going to have in that house, there's something that's taking the weight. And when the Bible talks about foundations, what is your life, what's the, what's the load-bearing portion of your life look like? Everybody has one because life will load you down with weight. It will put pressure on you. There's things that go into your life that sometimes aren't easy to deal with. They're a struggle and everything. And, the, and you want to build the foundation correctly or the whole thing will crash pretty simple metaphor, but very important. So with that in mind, what I want to do here in just a moment, we're going to read a passage from the Bible. And the reason I want you to hear this passage is because it's the words of someone that it's obvious, according to the Bible, has an unshakable load-bearing foundation in his life. You can just tell it. You can feel it. You can hear it. I want you to think about his words. I want you to think about how he looks at life how he processes information and his situation. 
And listen to his language and take mental note of this is what a true, well-put-down foundation, a load-bearing foundation really, really looks like. Now, before I read it, there's a few things you need to know about it. I want you to imagine just in your mind, I always say, get in the time machine. Say, we're going to get in the time machine in our minds, go back to about this, the year 62 AD, right around there, 62 AD, and picture the city of Rome, the city of Rome of its day, all roads led there. It was the metropolis. It was the New York, Tokyo, Paris kind of place. Everybody went there. It was a very busy, bustling kind of area. And then just go down the streets and find a house. And of one of many, many houses and walk in there and there's a gentleman in there who's not allowed to leave. He's on house arrest. And they hadn't invented ankle bracelets yet, at least kind of we have these days. Their version of an ankle bracelet was an actual chain around your ankle and you were chained to a Roman soldier. So you wouldn't go anywhere. Now the good thing about that is he, he, couldn't, he couldn't leave, but people could come to him. So it's not a terrible environment, it's in a home, he's, and people can come, they can visit, they can hang out, and he's been there for about two years. Now along that two years, kind of later on, he gets a care package from one of the churches. Church sent him a care package. I mean, it's got the Sour Patch in there, pistachio nuts, beef jerky, little back scratcher thing, you know, some money. It's, it's got all the things that he loves. And he looks at the care package, he's like, check it out, man, I love beef jerky, thank you so much. So he decides to write the people a letter to tell them about a situation, thank them for the care package. Now here's the only other thing you need to know about that situation though. It's not unpleasant, except for one thing. He knows at any moment, someone could walk in the door and say, you're set free, you can leave, or you're gonna die today. Can you imagine? Any moment, any day, any hour, someone could walk in because they're going to render a verdict on his case. That's why he's under house arrest. In those days, that's kind of how they operated. And it's kind of extreme. For two years, at any moment, any day, any time, they could, someone could walk in and say, you're going to live, you're free to go, take the chain off, go about your business. Or you're going to die, we're going to walk you down, chop off your head just down the street here. Think about the tension, the anxiety of that, the struggle of that. And then listen to the words. They're words written by a guy by the name of Apostle Paul the Apostle Paul, and the letter he's writing is to the church that's based out of Philippi. And we're just going to kind of uh, jump into the middle of his thoughts, but listen very carefully to the language of load-bearing foundation, okay? He says, yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that in no, I will in no way be ashamed, but have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I'm going on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of Did you hear a load-bearing foundation in those words, someone facing that situation? You might go free, you might die. It's funny how he sounds almost. It's like, I don't know. If they show up and they say, I'm free, hey, I get to work with you, Uh, it'll mean fruitful labor, everything's gonna be awesome. But then, here's where he goes off the beam. He says, if they show up and say, I'm gonna die, that's better by far, I'm torn. How many of you would legitimately be torn over that one? We'd all be kind of wondering, oh gosh, oh gosh, they're going to show up, please let me go, please let me go, please, please, let let it be free, let it be free. And he's saying, man, I don't know, that is an unshakable foundation that could bear any weight because it's borne the ultimate weight. And it's summed up in one statement that I want you to get more than any other single statement if you don't get anything else. He says, a foundation looks like this. To me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. 
Now, I have a feeling, and I say this about myself, and I say this about everybody else across our fine three campuses, probably most of us have a hard time saying that with a deep degree of (laughs) real sincerity. To me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. As we start our foundation laying, my challenge to all of us is, is we talk about building cities and we talk about arts and economy and loving our neighbors and doing all these things. I want to start in the place of laying a load-bearing foundation that sounds like that. Uh, I, I shared this before. I'm going to share it again because uh, 2018, for me personally, I don't know what yours was like. I gave it a thumbs up in the overall. I mean, that's a really interesting challenge. I could have done without But in the overall, it was like one of these. 2017 was one of these. 2016 was one of those. 2018 for me was one of these. And and, and there's one key thing marked me in 2018 more than any other deal. And it's related to this. And I shared this before, I'm going to share it again. It was a new and fuller realization that the single most important thing in anyone's life, period, is to have a real living, breathing, growing, and deepening relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, as soon as I say that, the only reason I hesitate is I I think people are like, well, you're a preacher, you're supposed to say that. That's what preachers say at churches on days like today. That's your gig, that's what you do. But that's my whole point. In 2018, it's like I knew it before, but I got to see it like I've never seen it before. And I've just made it a thing in, my, in the rest of the run of my life, whether I have two days or 20 more years or 30 or 40, I, uh, whether or not I have that, it is that I consider the single most important thing you can place in anyone's life is a living and breathing and real, true, developing, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's why it was affirmed to me. Lots and lots of different ways. I shared a story before, but I'm going to share a little bit more detail. For instance, one of the things that happened to me, aunt of mine who died, she was in her late 70s. I didn't know a lot about her life. I just knew her as my aunt. She was a wonderful woman, admired her. She was part of our family. We were very close. But what I didn't know was that when we gathered around to talk about her after she passed away, they said when she, she was hired by a corporation here in, in Evansville, uh, and she was the youngest person they had ever hired. She was that sharp. She was still in high school, and they hired her in her office job in a corporation. She was that sharp. She was drop-dead gorgeous physically and all the rest. She had that whole package. But that same year that she got hired, a doctor looked at her and said, we have discovered that you have a rare condition and chronic condition that will keep you in pain in and out of hospitals for the rest of your life. Now, I knew her as being in and out of hospitals the rest of her life. But as I sat at that funeral, I listened to people talk about someone who was deeply kind, beautifully compassionate, wonderfully in love with God. And I thought, how do you do that? Especially when you have, from your own vantage point, every right to be bitter and angry, and I was dealt a bad hand, what in the world is going on with me? No, and I thought, how do you do that? And she, and as I examined her life, it's absolutely true. She was a student of the Bible. She loved Jesus. She had a living, breathing, real, growing, deepening relationship with Jesus. And I want to pause right here real quick. Those of you who have come to Jesus, you've prayed the prayer and you've been baptized, don't think of what I'm saying as being simply for those who don't have that. I'm talking to myself. I'm asking about a real developing, growing thing that can bear the weight. It's not just one of those things where I prayed at a church camp and you know, said, you know, said a thing and I got baptized and now I try to be moral as much as I possibly can. I'm talking about what if you want to have a load-bearing foundation It takes a living, breathing, real, walking, talking relationship with him. Because listen to Paul's words. First of all, he's able to lay the foundation because he's eliminated the ultimate thing that we all would fear. We all would beg for him when they come in the door, please let it be free, don't let it be death. He handled it. And so the first thing all of us have to come to a place of, and it's very, very difficult to do, and it's much easier said than done, is do we see that to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Yeah, right, okay. Maybe someday it'll be gain, but not today. But he had that literal, you can hear it in his voice. But I want you to think about why, why? What was it about it? 
Very interesting. He says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. You know how he viewed death? He didn't view death as in heaven as I finally get the dream house. You know, and I'm sure maybe your dream house will be there. The back cave will be there waiting for you. He didn't view it that way. I've heard, you know, heaven kind of, you know, it's, it's that place where all the golf shots go straight down the middle kind of thing. And, and, and some people go, that would be hell for me. A golf course is there, please. No, don't do that. Don't make me watch it, especially. You know, so there have, we, we all kind of place it in, in those kind of categories. Heaven's going to be where the fishing is always awesome and all that kind of stuff. And it may be. But how did he view it? He saw it as a continuation of what he already had. He, Paul wouldn't have cared if heaven was a parking lot. He said, I desire to depart and what? Be with Christ. Heaven was a relationship with Jesus without the interruptions and the frustrations and hardships of this life. He saw on this side, for me to live is Christ. In other words, my relationship is everything. It's the whole deal, but here it gets interrupted by all the anxieties and the, the problems and the issues and the bills that we have to pay and, and our relational challenges that we have and that person at work that we just can't get along with. We're interrupted a lot. And what he said was better by far. The reason it was better by far, it was a relationship with Christ without distortions, straight on, where I can just see him and he can see me and I can see who he is. And if he happens to take me into what looks like a dream house, all the better, but that's not the object. That's what I'm talking about. That lays a foundation where literally you have a guy where they could have walked in and said, you're free or you die, and he was like, I don't know, man. It's a really hard choice to make. So he has to have that part covered. But it's not just our physical death. You know, sometimes I also hesitate around that. It's like, I can imagine people coming here for the first time, a religious environment, a church environment, for the first time in a long time. All you people ever talk about is death. Heaven, hell, and all that. And first of all, it's not all we ever talk about. But it's also something that deserves it because we're all going to do it. Every single person is, it's a realistic thing to talk about. Every single person. Think about this. In some form or fashion, we're all in that room every single day. Because none of us know if today's the day I get to go free, go about my business, or if today's the day. Our lifespan averages around late 70s, but none of us has that guarantee. And, and so in some ways, you're always choosing that. Every, every day is that choice. But here's the other thing. It's not only about the final marker. Death in this world has a way of corrupting many other things, not just the final thing where you die, but in sicknesses and injustices that we experience, the frustrations and hardships of life, the, all the, 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 the weight that we take in other ways. How do you deal with that? He says, for me to live is Christ to die is gain. I want you to remember that passage we just read, and I'm going to tie it to another one at the end of the same letter. That was at the beginning. The end of the same letter says something very, very interesting about this life and what a weight-bearing foundation really, really looks like in this life. And it's a passage that, that's used by athletes a lot. Uh, Steph Curry is the latest. I mean, he's the latest famous one. He writes Philippians 4.13 on his sneakers. He goes out in the game. I read an interview with him. He's like, it, it, it's, it's, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm like, cool, that's a very cool thing to do. And Christ is strengthening him a lot more than he is other players. I mean, it, it's uh, because he's hitting three-pointers like crazy and, and all that. And he's strengthening him a lot more than he has me. I've never hit a three-pointer in my life, I don't think. You know, so, but he, he has that. It's used by athletes. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just incomplete because we can get the idea, it's almost like a motivational speech. You can do all things through Christ just strengthened you. You have a dream, you can get it, you know, that kind of stuff. That's an American version of that passage. But I want you to hear the original passage in its original context from the guy that's sitting in that room waiting to see if he lives or dies. Philippians chapter 4, beginning of verse 11, says this. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Love the care package, in other words. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, I'm not saying this because I am in need. I love the Sour Patch candy, but I don't have to have it. I'm not in need. I'm okay. I have four. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any in every situation, and then he fills that out, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. 
I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So in other words, the point of the passage is not Christ will strengthen you to only hit three pointers. It's Christ will strengthen you when, heaven forbid, Steph Curry maybe is in an accident and can never play basketball again in his life. See the difference? None of us knows what's going to come this year. None of us knows the challenge. None of us knows the weight bearing we will do. Things might, and I love the fact that he says, I know what it is to have plenty. More power to you. If, things, if you just got a raise and things are better financially than they've ever been, great. That is wonderful. But that's not always going to last. What if the economy tanks? What if, what if your industry goes downhill? There's all these different things that can come along, right? It's not about, you know, Christ who strengthens me so I can do all things and make things awesome and wonderful and great and circumstances are always good. Because sometimes you're going to get the death version of things are going to turn. And that's the difference. What happens when your props are pulled out? I don't want the props to pull out. Maybe they won't be. What's bearing the load when the props are pulled out? When health is gone? We celebrate a young man, a uh, young, young woman named Amy Higgins. She was at our West Side campus. The courier uh, uh, in Evansville said that it was the second most read story all year of 2018. It was this young lady who faced a... Uh, Deadly illness. And she used to get asked all the time, how are you handling this the way you're handling it? And her answer was that. It was a living, breathing, growing, deepening relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing else can bear the weight. Now my question for all of us is very simple. There's some of you that you've heard this stuff before and you're like, I don't know if I even believe it or not, which is which is fair. My challenge to you in this moment, we're gonna give you a chance to think about this, is why don't you believe it? Is it a hang up of everything from science to something that happened when you were growing up, you saw hypocrisy on display? There are others of us that, we're, that we, we, we've had that before, but we prayed a prayer years ago and, and if we're being really, really deeply honest with ourselves and with God, to say to live as Christ and to die as gain is not exactly our MO. I mean, come on, let's just be honest here. That that relationship is not this thing that's just, it is our life. Everything else is just kind of window dressing. And there are those of us who really would like to be able to say that with sincerity but want to go deeper with it. And my challenge is very simple. Wherever you are, just make a move. Wherever you are, just take a step and say, that's the kind of foundation I want, and that's the kind of foundation I need, because you will get your turn at the death thing. It's going to happen. And according to the scriptures, you can be free, and you can have a relationship with Jesus that was out with distortions, or you will have no relationship at all, and you will have every distortion that eternity has to offer. That's called hell. But it's not only that. It's this life right here. What happens when the props are pulled out? What kind of foundation are you? Do you have a load-bearing foundation or not? So across all three of our campuses, I'd like you to do something. I'd like everybody to bow their heads. If closing your eyes makes you sleepy, please don't do it. Just look at the floor. All it's trying to do is give you some thought time, some reflective time. I was watching more than just my aunt or Amy Higgins. I saw several of these. When life all comes down, and it wasn't just deaths, it was people going through amazingly difficult things. Do you have a load-bearing foundation? If you're in that first group, I just want to invite you to ask, okay, if you don't believe it, why? Why not? And that's okay. We want to be a kind of place that fields questions. We want you to be open and honest about your struggles. You think this stuff is too exclusive, or you think it's scientifically problematic. You think it's, you don't know that Jesus is who he said he was. All I would challenge you to do is define what your doubt is and pursue. Step in because the stakes are too high. You have one life and one life only. That's it. And so please, just at least do a serious examination of where you are to try to take a step. Some of you are in a place, you know this stuff, but you have never stepped over and you have never placed your full and complete trust in who Jesus is. 
His death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, you've never even entered that relationship and you've been putting it off, you've been procrastinating and you just need to say, okay, today's the day. I'm going to do this. Pray that prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I want that relationship with you starting today. Mark it. That's your assignment. And then the third group of us, and I'm in this camp, I want that to be my life-defining sentence. I want it to be something, but I know I'm not there. If I'm being real, I don't think I could write that sincerely in a letter to another group of people for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. And so my challenge to you would be to pray. Lord, show me how to get there. Show me how to relate to you in such a way where I could say that with sincerity and make this year a time, and before I go out and build a great city, that you'll build in me that kind of heart. So pick your prayer, pick your angle, and I'm just going to let the rooms fall silent for a moment, and I'll close this out in prayer here in a moment. And if our prayer teams across all of our campuses want to come forward at this time, maybe you want to pray with someone about that kind of thing, please do that. No one's looking around anyway. Just kind of go up and take advantage of that. Take a few moments. Lord, I know that you've provided the beauty of having an outlook like Paul's that seems light years away from any of us. And I pray that this won't be a guilt thing. It will be a wise move that people from all walks of life that are represented under the hearing of my voice, including myself, that I ask for a new way to see how to make that a sincere foundation for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. And if I'm to go on living in the body, it's fruitful labor. If I, if I go ahead, it's, it's better by far. Help us to see that for real and build our lives on that in whole new ways, whether it's being in Scripture, worshiping on different levels, serving, loving. Speak to every heart where they need to be spoken to in a way that will mark us and make us where these things aren't just words, but they're actual life realities. We thank you for what you've given. We thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.